Namo Tassa Bhagavato Aramato Sama Kapula Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good one. Okay. Okay. So tonight we are going to have uh, an evening where we do uh, a workshop, the same as the one that's online for you. I'm going to do this. And um, before I start, I want to make sure everybody has a piece of paper and, um, you know, two pieces of paper that are taped together in front of you. Your paper is supposed to be big like this. This is a big sheet. You can't do it up together. And what you do is fold your paper in half, and then you fold your paper in half again, and crease them, and then you actually fold them three times and crease them really hard so you have one piece like that, right? So this is how wide one column is going to be on your paper. And then when you open it up, after you do that, it up and you're going to take the top of your paper and what I did was I fold it down about, for about a half an inch or maybe even well a half inch is enough for the first fold across the whole thing on the top and then you fold it an inch and a half or two inches wherever you want to do it again here right Okay, so once you do this, okay, then we have 12 columns. You see the 12 columns. And what we do is we have a ruler and a, and a pen or a pencil, and you can draw your lines in where you did your folds so that you have headings. The small piece on the top is for column. If you look at it, have a, a, a small fold on the top. This is the column word, and then the next pieces that are like that. See that one as for the name of the top piece, and it has a couple pieces of information in it that go there too. And then we will go through the step by step, put the names and put the short definitions. The point of having you do this way, I hope nobody's going to cheat, <laughs> because I know some of you have the chart, but it's, if you do this, this is a great way to learn it, the way we figured it out, step by step, erasure by erasure, step by step, and definition by definition by definition until Bonte and I agreed on it. It's easy Learn. And then maybe we would go back later and we would erase, erase, erase again and try again for another retreat to find out if everybody understood it. And that's how the chart came into being. Okay. So before I start, I'm going to read something for you that I found this in, this is actually from Mark uh, Johnson's book. He used a reference that had to do with the the late uh, Ajahn Buddhadasa in Thailand. And Ajahn Buddhadasa has a really interesting story that we can appreciate because he worked his whole life to stop people from just taking the Vasudhimaga and believing it and taking it as the word for what the Buddha taught. And uh, he wrote a book on Paticca Samapada that was very, very detailed that we went through and looked at. And he was trying to get people to understand this was something to be used. And uh, when you listen to this, you can understand that I could relate to this 
when I was doing this because it made me see that he wanted it to be used by people. And by the way, right now, some of the older monks, the Thai monks, are the ones that don't want anybody to be teaching, but teach a Samapada. They don't want the monks to teach the lay people. They consider it a very private matter. You can learn it a simple way across three lifetimes, like on the back page of a Sudhimaga, but to examine it and actually use it, they consider it a private matter. In, in Canada, especially, the Thai monks feel that way. This is just something that happens uh, desperation to have something that is kind of a secret when there were no secrets in Buddhist teaching. So here's what Buddha Das has said about this. In studying the dependent origination, it is not necessary to take the original Pali scriptures as a foundation. Don't surrender to the commentaries with your eyes and ears closed. And don't submit 100% to later works such as the Vasudhimaga. Indeed, it is believed that the author of the Vasudhimaga is the same person who collected all the commentaries together so that the total acceptance of the commentaries would allow only one voice to be heard, giving rise to an intellectual monopoly. So we must guard our rights and use them in a way that is consistent with the advice given in the Kalama Sutta and according to the principles of the Mahapadesa as given in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. And what this is referring to in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta was that there are no secret teachings and that everything uh, it should not be accepted. It, we, we should not take any, um, any teacher, we should stay open to and respectful to listening, but we should not, not question. We should question everything and test everything because his method originally was to learn the Dhamma by um, knowledge and vision first, which was like a foundation stone for knowledge and wisdom to be built on, you see? And he has, you'll, you've heard a couple of suttas already in Majjhima Nikaya number 18. Uh, you heard the monk chew out younger monks for letting the Buddha go in to his kuti after saying a statement and they didn't ask him what it meant. So they went to another monk and they asked him the first thing the senior monk did was scold those monks and told them don't go away from the master teacher until you have the answer. If you have a teacher who is giving you answers, ask them, ask them, ask them. You don't have to believe them. You're in, in our case, definitely, we tell you, you should go and check it. Because what we're interested in is when we give you something, can you test it and make it what we read to you or explain to you how it's working? Is it working? Does it help you? Well, if it doesn't help you, then okay. You put it in the trash can as you go out and then you figure out another way. It's fine. We don't care. It's all right. But we're trying, what we work really hard for you is trying to teach you in a way where you will use this in your life. Roll it over from here in the retreat world into the life world and get them to work together. That's where we get the best stories from you all writing to us and telling us what is happening that is changing for you. So you see a light in the future, no darkness. You're not stuck. You're never stuck. All things are changing all the time. And now it's a shock. Most people don't know that word, right? They don't know that Anicca word. And so now it's a shock. And now it's been so long with what's happening with COVID. 
and nature is real and things are changing and people are downsizing and getting to a point, is this how are we gonna, they're looking now, are there gonna be food shortages? Are there gonna be, uh, soon? We, sh we have to be very careful how we decide to just stand by and watch. Sounds like an okay decision, won't be anything off us, but I'll tell you a story when I was growing up, when I was little, my grandmother had a house near the beach, very close to the beach in New Jersey. There was a big highway and every summer there were people having accidents and car wrecks on that. And there were ambulances coming. Whenever the ambulance was heard, she was very strict with us. We all had to stop, think of the person, wish for them that they're okay, see ourselves being in the accident, Remember, if we didn't think about them and if we were there, we needed to stop and help them. We were taught this from when we were very young. So this is really important because if you don't stop, just keep thinking about, I'm going to watch all this happen and I'm going to just not do anything. I'm just going to watch and then wonder for a minute after you go home, when I'm in that position, who is going to help me? and start rethinking this a little bit because small things count for a lot right now, a whole lot, a whole lot. And if you don't need that extra portion of meal, if you don't need it, a couple of days a week and give some people some money for food. That really, really helps right now. Not a little bit, but a lot. your pages you were given you were given four pages three pages or four pages and somebody tell me was it three or four and i'm going to pull your files up first and we're going to go through why in the world should we be learning this because if you don't understand why you're learning this you're certainly not going to bother to learn it the way i want you to learn it <laughs> You know, so you need to understand it. So um, let me just go out of here for a second. And I remember how to do this. And I know right where they are. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so now I come back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I come back to you guys. And when I come back to you, then I'm gonna go to screen share. I have to take you through this way um, and can put this up, okay? Okay, so you should have this page, okay? And the first page of the workshop, um, is basically that it is about Paticca Samapada or the dependent origination. This is a form of human cognition study. We're taking Paticca Samapada out of the box and back into life. If you haven't done it after this is over, if you want to hear this retreat again, you can go over to YouTube and you can um, you up here down there whoops i thought you were supposed to spread out okay you can go down to youtube and you can uh listen to it you just have to search for uh, dependent origination workshop okay now what this is about is after many discussions and talking about what the dependent origination, how it was being presented in the text did not match up with the way that people were teaching it. The question was, what was the Buddha actually doing 
with the, the dependent origination. So we're showing you a middle way of seeing the dependent origination that, and this first page explains it's a phenomenological approach that looks at one event happening in life at a time. This is not a new idea. Actually, there was a psychologist in the 1940s before World War II named Dr. Harvey, who had this idea that if you have a bad habit and you want to break it, you should first look at it one event at a time. And he was pretty popular. The only thing that happened was World War II. And when that happened in Pearl Harbor, 1941, he was 1940, he was doing this. Once we got into the war, Dr. Harvey disappeared, but later, I think someone got a hold of this information at university or something because it was the beginning of behavior modification psychology that began to happen in our schools after the war. And that's become quite popular now to look at one event and figure out exactly what happened in it. And that's what the Buddha was doing. So the first exercise we go through here is justification. People asked us for justifications. We had to make this page. So if you're interested in where this idea comes from, text justifications and rebalancing before learning the dependent origination is really important. It's very important. And if you, the question here is Q, he's coming in, um, and I have an unstable connection, so I'm not sure if I'll break off or not. All right. If you have a chance to say one short sentence in one half minute to 10,000 people in front of you about what the Buddha taught, which noble truth would you mention? This is Q's question. <laughs> and the third noble truth we would say is there is a cessation of suffering because it's the good news in Buddhism. It's the gift that was given to the people and surely the people in the audience are gonna get curious if you walk off the stage after saying that and come to you and say, they're gonna to want to learn more. But if you were to get up and say, there is suffering or life is suffering. No, nobody's, we figure nobody's gonna come talk to you afterwards, <laughs> you know? So the second question Q asks is, do the foundation teachings for Buddhist meditation with the way out of suffering still exist and are they described in the Pali texts? The answer is yes. The instructions still exist. They are understandable and you can test them for yourself. The results are as described when the instructions are followed exactly. And next question Q asks is why is it important to understand dependent origination to see what the Buddha taught? And the answer is that the impersonal process of human cognition is the spine of the Buddha Dhamma. Watching it closely allows you to witness the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape from suffering. Actually, it, it lets you see the escape from all phenomena. If you look in certain places, you have all of this right in front of you. The next question is uh, text verification specifically, and I was asked to find at least a bunch of those. So in Majima Nikaya number 28, section 28, there is a sentence, and because it's repeated so many times in the sutta, uh, and it's supported also in other suttas, you'll find the same thing stated. He who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. He who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. So that makes you think this must have been important. That's where we got with that, that kept coming up. 
is it really important, this part? Point number two, in the Mahavaga, uh, which is a part of the Vinaya, it informs us that a meditator can see all of the characteristics of existence. That's a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta, without seeing dependent origination. But when the meditator sees the links of dependent origination, they will always see all three characteristics of existence. And the reason this is important is because so many times the teachers are putting out that the Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta is the key to everything. But the question we had is if that's true, where is it in the text anywhere that says a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta or the three characters of existence? If you see that, you see the entire Dhamma, and it isn't, it isn't there. We went to many scholars about this and asked them, and the, the answer was, it isn't there. But if you, it's important for you to see that, if you've been told that for so long, and that's the one thing that you want to see and understand, what this is telling you is if you, pray, if you study and to learn to see the dependent origination and understand how it works, you will realize all three of those characteristics. And in the writing I've done before, in some of the things I've shown you, we, I've tried to point that out to you, especially with the uh, practice of TWIM, how all of it is there right in front of you. Point number three, in nearly all Buddhist traditions, I'm unstable again, my connection is unstable. In nearly all, connect, all um, the Buddhist traditions, for over 2,500 years, the following chant is repeated. The Buddhist teaching was easy to understand for the wise, immediately effective here and now, inviting deeper inspection and untouched by time. Now, so what was, the, uh, was this easy to understand meditation practice and how was it immediately effective? And this is what Bhante wanted to know and pushed him on his search to keep going until he figured it out. And point number four, which meditation to pursue? Well, in the Digha Nikaya, in 28, section 10, we find the modes of progress. And this, the modes of progress are interesting uh, because we see that our, our progress, at, we can see our progress as we train if we understand these four modes of progress. And they reveal to us what excellent progress in the Buddhist meditation was. So he declared to his students, the monks, number one, painful meditation with slow comprehension is poor progress. And number two, painful meditation with quick comprehension is poor progress. And number three, pleasant meditation with slow comprehension is poor progress. And number four, pleasant meditation with quick comprehension is excellent progress. There's only one is excellent progress. Pleasant meditation, the opposite of painful meditation, with quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma. The important thing about this modes of progress chart is it's telling us that the Buddha was, was rating the progress of his monks based on not just their meditation capability, but their meditation and their comprehension of the Buddha Dhamma combined. And we see in our practice as we're teaching it how a student can kind of get messed up if they've got really great meditation and zoom along, but they don't get the comprehension. We have to try to get them to, to run a parallel training. This is real interesting to see that you have to have this parallel going on. Okay, point number five, 
By practicing these six steps of TWIM cycle, you are completing the four steps of right effort to purify your mind and, com and you are completing four kinds of right striving found in Majima Nikaya number 77. In that uh, particular sutta, it, you'll find it's listed as striving and always right striving and right effort are the same thing. They are synonymous. Um, it's a funny thing because Nanamoli preferred striving and in his generation, it's understandable because they were relying on the meditation from the Vasudhimaga and it was very much striving, striving, striving. Okay. And then Bhikkhu Bodhi, he was willing to call it the right effort and use right effort term, but they, the paragraphs and situations of it are exactly the same, um, word for word. To develop a harmonious practice, you have to follow uh, fully be practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, living it all the time in life and keeping your precepts. The twin steps of your practice are to recognize an unwholesome state of mind. The mark of the unwholesome state is the increase in tension and tightness. Release the unwholesome state, drop the attention off it and relax any leftover tension and tightness in the mind and body. The third, or you can look at this either way, the third or the fifth, <laughs> re-smile to bring up a wholesome mind state as you return mind's attention to your object of meditation. The act of smiling lightens mind and sharpens awareness. That's why you're doing it. And the last part is now keep the wholesome state going Keep the wholesome state uh, going as you return mind's attention to your object of meditation. The act of smiling lightens mind and sharpens awareness. I'm sorry, I skipped a line. Uh, repeat those six steps whenever mind's attention is pulled away from your object of meditation or your daily task. Following this cycle, you will purify and retrain your brain. Remember, when you look at the right effort, remember it has basically four pieces and there's two and two. And the first two pieces of it have to do with purification of the mind. And the second two parts of the right effort have to do with retraining the mind to continually keep up bringing up the wholesome mind states. So we're agreeing with the modern research. You cannot change the habitual tendency to be in the unwholesome states unless you use repetition to retrain the brain. Okay, it's important to see that we do that. Um, following this cycle, oh boy, where did I stop reading? Okay. <laughs> um, right. Following this cycle, you will purify and retrain your mind so that it tends towards more wholesome mind states. The most wholesome mind state is when you are on your subject, your object of meditation, or you are nicely attending to a daily task with a gentle attention. Practicing metta carries you to the fourth jhana, karuna to the base of infinite space, joy to infinite consciousness and equanimity to the base of nothingness. Metta doesn't carry you. What you'll find, people will argue with you against us by saying, you know, that's just stupid. Metta doesn't take you to Nibbana. And that's right. Metta takes you to the fourth, uh, the fourth jhana. And it moves into and changes into Karuna, which culminates at the base of infinite space and the rolls over into joy, and that one culminates in infinite consciousness, and equanimity rolls over and goes to the base of nothingness. The point here is, rather than stand there and argue that they're wrong and you're right, you can say, you're absolutely right. Well, that will shut them up right away. <laughs> and then you say to them this whole line 
of metta goes to the fourth jhana, karuna to infinite space, joy to infinite consciousness, equanimity to the base of nothingness, and then you're in such an extreme uh, state of equanimity and you're using then mind as the object of meditation. You're in quiet mind. This practice supports us to the liberation of mind. That's true. The Brahma Viharas carry you to Nibbana. I bet it would be more logical to say that to the person. But to say claim metta does is a tough call because, like I said, just handle it that way. So real equanimity, um, real equanimity, uh, something doesn't jump. It doesn't jump at all. The heart doesn't move. We discussed this the other day when we were talking about what is the equanimity, how, what is the nature of it, and how it develops from the very beginning when you're first starting to practice meditation to a tiny bit and gradually grows, grows, grows to a stable level in the fourth jhana to carry you through the, and support you for the mental states. Okay, and the heart won't speed up, the stomach doesn't churn if there is any sudden impact through a sense door. And this kind of stability supports investigation into the deepest states to watch how mind works. And this is the full culmination point for the Brahma Viharas. And Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation in the Samyutta Nikaya, if you look at page 1607, it will confirm for you uh, the culmination states in that little sutta that's talking about, um, about uh, the Brahma Viharas and loving kindness. Okay, now in point six, does twin practice lead us to fully understanding the Four Noble Truths? Because I, you say to yourself, if I'm serious about this, I don't want to be practicing something unless it's going to help me to understand the Four Noble Truths completely. Yes, it does. Every time you complete the six R's, you experience these Four Noble Truths. There is suffering, you recognize the movement of mind's attention and witness attention and tightness, you see the suffering. There is the cause of suffering, real releasing the tension and tightness is letting go of the craving, witnessing the root cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering, releasing and relaxing, we witness the mundane cessation of suffering and see pure mind. And there is a path to the cessation of suffering to re-smile, return, and repeat completes the entire Eightfold Path. We haven't done that lesson yet, but when we teach the Eightfold Path, we teach you three different versions of it. Uh, a general version that they teach the uh, community of lay people to use in life, and then one for your meditation, practice to support your meditation, and then one where you can actually complete the whole eightfold path in one smile. So when we examine it more and more closely, smaller and smaller and smaller, we see the whole eightfold path being practiced with the way that we're showing you. In exercise number two, this is important. It turned out that when I first tried to teach this, I could not get people balanced enough to start the workshop. I'll show you what I mean. If you are attending the workshop before building your main dependent origination chart, for better understanding, we need to realign ourselves with our life continuum line. This will make you, your use of the finished chart much clearer. And so I want you to take a moment and review in your mind what is true about the past, what is true about the future, and what is true about the present. Write down what you think is true about the past. And now, what's true about the future? And lastly, write down a note. What is true? Just the tiny points. What is true about the present time? And when we look at this drawing, it's very simple. And we've always been talking in this group 
how can we teach this to just anybody? And this is one of the things you can teach to anybody. You draw a line and you put an X at either end and one of them is birth, okay? And the other one is death. In the middle, you have the present moment, but we call this the present time. Calling it the present moment is like studying dependent origination as it operates in the brain, which we can't do because there's millions and millions of these wheels going around. It's too fast. But if you learn to apply it to the present time of where you are, what you're doing, the task you're doing at work, wherever it is, and you look at it from that angle, it gets much easier. You need to remember that the past is history. It's over. The energy of past events are frozen in time. That energy is used up. And we cannot change the past event. And the way that we teach this is we usually ask a person to tell us. I even do this little thing of where I'm a little child and I come to you and I say, mommy, can you tell me I have the spelling words? You know, I have the, these words. Can you tell me what is, what is the past? And then ask the person, get them to tell you and say, what else, what else, what else, until they don't say anything more. And you can, if they don't speak, you can ask them, can I change it? Can I color it a different color? Can I shape it or mold it like sculpture into some other shape? No, because it's in the past, because that's over and locked in time, frozen in time. My other word is the future, and the future is a mystery, but what does future mean? It's something that isn't here yet. We don't know what it means. Why can't you tell me what it means? You're my mom. You should be able to tell me what it means. Yes, but no one knows what it's going to be. It could be this. It could be that. We don't know. Okay. And so by doing that, the person can relate to you what you're trying to do. And where is the present time? It's right here. The present time is what you're doing right now. You are in the present time. Now, present moment's real if you want to go there, but you just can't. It's like saying, show me a nanosecond. <laughs> okay. So present time, okay, is interesting because what's true, uh, this makes you see the finish chart a lot clearer. And then... Q says, but what good is this information? Well, it helps you to regain your behavioral balance as you begin to study how things work. Investigating Paticca Samapada first, you have to see clearly the value of releasing any past emotional reactions and any grudges, anything you want to clean out if you're carrying grudges or angers or revenge or anything or hate or jealousy, I don't care what it is. You, in fact, you really want to do a little bit of forgiveness for a little while and we can show you how to do that. And you want to clean it out and really let go. And this helps us to see that whatever we recall, whenever we recall memories, they are essentially just memories and they're nothing more because the energy in the future, the future's not here. The only energy we have to talk about is the energy we have right here today. And you don't want to be giving your energy away to past lamentations and despair on the past or worrying too much about the future. So the next thing we look closely at the logic of letting go of any worry about future because it's not here yet. And the kind of worry can only cause stress. And lastly, we discover the present time and we reclaim our, by doing that, something happens to us when we start playing with this. People start to smile at you when you stop, talk about the present time. Because how would it feel if you went through the day and all you had to worry about it's the present time of what you were only doing and that's all. And when you start to look at just the present time, you reclaim our lightness of our being just in this 
here and now time. Each present time moment is a gift. It's a present and it's the only place that you are alive. That's really cool. When you go to the dictionary and you look up um, alive, you're going to find something in there about the present, something about the continuum. In the continuum, it's where you're alive, is in this little spot. Not here, not there, just here. Use this information wisely and follow the next chart uh, that we start to work on and see why we look at this subject in this way and it helps us here and now. So the third exercise is before you go any further, you should know that other uh, ways traditionally that were used to present dependent co-arising or or the impersonal process of dependent origination, that although they're valuable in other ways, maybe, they are not as applicable for us here and now in our day-to-day -day interactions in this life. So you read that over a few times to get it, okay? But basically today, there are three uh, to look in, three ways to look into dependent origination. Two ways are difficult to understand. Only one of them seems applicable here in this life. So when we looked at it, we said, how can we look at it? And Ajahn Chah teaches the story of, I don't talk to you a lot, he said, about teaching you this dependent origination because let's be honest, when the apple falls off the tree from there to the ground, there was 150,000 or more of these little turns Bonte says one click of your finger 250,000 times, spinning in your mind, attempting to observe all the tiny mind movements not immediately useful to us here and now. To what? To help us sort out our relationships, to find new ways for peace negotiations and, and better, um, better um, how do we say, uh, objectives in the whole world. Can we use this microscopic view to help us do that? We can't really. It's not sensible to think of it that way. And then the second one that we look at is over on the right, on the other side of your page. The macroscopic view is a philosophical explanation spanning three actual lifetimes, most often presented, but this does not seem to help us here and now during this lifetime, um, also, it's not Buddhist, as, as uh, Buddha Dasa was trying to explain. It's not Buddhist. Now, I want to point out something funny about that, because I went there one time, and I sat for an hour, and then I opened the, the Sudimaga to the last page of the book, where they have the chart for this three-lifetime example. And I kept trying to figure out, started thinking about but well, what was he talking about when he said he taught the middle way? What does it really mean? They give you, you know, eternalism or annihilationism. But what if he was teaching everything that he was teaching in the middle way? Then it would give you something to look at and say the extreme or the, minis the minimal and the, the maximum way. What if he was teaching the middle way of a lot of what he was teaching? So I've been examining this over the years. When we look at this example, we say, instead of looking microscopically or macroscopically, let's look at the middle way. What would the middle way be? And then we remember Dr. Harvey in 1940s in psychology that my daughter actually clued me into. She's a psychologist now. And uh, she, she showed me that and I'm there, wow, that's really something. And this daily life, real time events, using the process to watch daily phenomenological events. Now this big word, phenomenological, <laughs> it just means one phenomena arising at a time, logically looking at how one event happens in order to understand how a whole habitual tendency operates like 
an anger habit or something, but stopping and studying one event to see how that works so that you understand how things work. It's a lot easier to water ski or to ride a bike or to play tennis if you understand what a racket is and a pair of skis and um, whatever you're doing, the bicycle or anything. To understand what the equipment is first makes it a lot easier to, to get involved in anything. Okay, so that's the rebalancing. Now, in the fourth, the fourth example, the middle way just seems to be the most effective way to study dependent origination for clear understanding of suffering. You learn and follow the main chart that we're going to build first to memorize the precise but simple definitions for each link. And then you make it a game to use the practice chart that follows to prove to yourself how the impersonal and the personal links occur within the framework of one phenomenological event occurring in your life at a time. So the example is two people who get angry yelling at each other. Remember the definition of craving as you work with this, and you can detect the symptom for the arising of the craving, the arising emotional state that follows by the change in the tension levels in your mind and body as they occur. And by releasing the attention on what came up and relaxing this tension, you're going to um, be releasing unwholesome states of mind. Now, Lord Buddha said something that we need to hold on to while we're looking at this and building the charts. He basically said, only one thing happens at a time. Because of this, for instance, when anger arises, if we laugh, then anger is no longer present. You replaced it with a new, lighter, wholesome mind state. Immediately, the heavy, dark state is gone. Therefore, a person can instantly stop anger from escalating. By shifting into a wholesome state of mind, speech, and body with a smile and a private giggle. <laughs> I got caught again, <laughs> you know, they got caught again. And that private little laugh you have lightly smiling at being caught once again by anger popping up. And it does, it pops up, that's true. Like sort of lightning, bang, yeah. But it is usually the best way to let the anger go immediately and change the whole situation. So. In this way, you keep up your humor. You keep it up. This is really, really, really important right now. I have gone through this week probably six or seven um, houses where there were lockdown issues, where someone's really upset because the house isn't working this way or that way, where the elder mom, or it can be younger moms and middle moms, Many people, the mom situation, they let the maid go from back to their village. They let the cook go. Now they're faced with having to deal with the whole house. But the whole house wasn't involved in keeping the house. Only mom was basically involved in the culture. And now there's a fuss of why do I have to clean? Why do I have to help do this or that? And without taking into account what mom had to do while everything was the way it was before we had it figured out but now what does this really mean it it's an opportunity for compassion from the kids from the men and the kids and anybody in the family that's staying with the other part of the family i was talking to people that had everybody in one spot <laughs> like 11 people but the maid and the cook and non-family members are not there anymore. And so the issue is, this is a compassion practice, a patience and a compassion practice and remembering loving kindness as your 
talking to the person who wants you to go scrub the floor or clean the bathroom or do something you never would have done before. Well, guess what? Everybody has to pull together. If you think anything about being a monk, believe me, everybody in the temple pulls together and makes it either good or really bad the way it is in the temples. It's either really livable or it's not, <laughs> you know? And this is because everybody's not pulling. And this is something that's really important at this particular time. You need to pretend you're at camp and they sent you at camp and everybody has to take turns taking care of things in the tent or the cabin that you're staying in or whatever the situation it is, it doesn't matter. It's, but look at it as an opportunity for loving kindness and compassion and sharing and getting everything done. You can also pretend that you're in the army. <laughs> You know, you're in the army or you're in the... Okay, um, now what we're going to do now is get your charts out and I'm going to come back to you and we're going to do this one step at a time. Wait a minute, I don't know how to get back. How do I get back? Um, wait a minute. Oh, let me get it back. There. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know how I get back. I'm always afraid I'm going to touch the wrong thing. There. Now, here we go. I can't get you guys. No, I know another way. Okay. So now I'm with you and, um, Mm -hmm. Stop share. That would have been a good idea. There you go. Okay. So now what you need to do is get your papers out. And as you're going to do this from the beginning, so you can fold your paper in half so that you are dealing with six, the, six of the uh, six of the columns. Six of the columns. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you're dealing with six columns, and we start to put the names on the top of the of the um, so long. So the first one, the first column, and if you're doing this and coloring it in later. What we did with the first column, we call avija, avija, a v i j j a, avija. And then in the square of the first column, you're going to call it ignorance. So this is ignorance. And I would put it in the middle of that square. Yeah, that's all right. You don't need to worry about that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, because I have to, we have to label these. Uh, I'll show you how. You can put it anywhere in that square, okay? So now, when you start on the column, this, the root word, this ignorance, you put this root word, root word is ignore to ignore and you know to ignore means to not pay attention to something to ignore it and so the question that is goes underneath where you put the root word is ignore you would say to ignore what to ignore um what is the question. And so this refers to something you're ignoring, but it's you're not your fault. I want to tell you it's not your fault right now, okay? Because if nobody told you about this even existing, how can it be your fault? Somebody said to me, I feel so guilty, it's my fault. I said, it's not your fault. No one told you about this. So you say, you, you leave a space and then you say, it refers and then 
ignoring, ignoring the, uh, the process of dependent origination. Okay, and then you put a semicolon, and then below that you say the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths And you put a semicolon there and you say end, and then you put the three characteristics. The three characteristics of existence. I know most of you probably know what they are, but if you want to put underneath that, you can just put Anicca. Dukkha Anatta. Okay. And the three, the three, what they mean is they mean impermanence. And the second one is suffering. And the third one is the impersonal nature of everything. That's what that is. So you have impermanence. suffering and the impersonal nature. Oh, everything. Okay. We make that column, we make it gray. And um, then what we usually do with that column is we take the paper and we fold it up Hold it away, we put it away. And so after we put that one away, now we're start again uh, with the with continuing with us. Because we're gonna break down the ignorance now. And every time you're practicing to learn anything, every knowledge that you're learning, anything at all, you are breaking down the barrier of the ignorance. The, the next one is the second one, the second one is Sankara. Sankara, S-A-N-K-H-A-R-A. And this one, we just call formations. Remember, we're going for the easiest way for you to learn this and there are other ways you can say volitional formations i like to just say formations oh i should give you the new word the new word is preparations preparation P preparations this is the new word that we were thinking about um calling it preparations right now, when you, un you describe this one in your column, it's, you write the potential, the potential for formations to arise. And then you make a space and then you say, there are, there are three kinds of formations. And remember what we did about this was we took the bare minimum. We had discussions about this. And we say just the three kinds of formations to remember one and then two and then three and you say body formations speech formations and mind formations three kinds okay okay the next column we say number three 
This one is um, called um, Winyana. Z I N N A N A. Vinyana, Vinyana. This one is consciousness. Consciousness. Now, all that we put on this one that seemed to be necessary for a person to think about is this is the potential. This is the potential for consciousness. which then operates individually, individually within the process of the six sense doors. Now what it's talking about, if you've been listening to me teaching you many times, I step back and I start to talk to you um, about how there's like a pool of consciousness. And yes, it's an ongoing dilemma. Everybody's hunting for where consciousness is in the human body. <laughs> They've been doing this for years and years. Nobody's figured it out yet. But it doesn't matter the way to think about this so you really understand it in relationship to how phenomena arises is to remember there's a pool of consciousness inside you, a supply of it, and that it works through the sense doors. So you, you, if the eye sees something, color and form, then eye consciousness must arise also. And those three pieces is eye contact. So you, the consciousness becomes Because what consciousness does, you can put a note down here. You could put a note at the bottom, say consciousness, consciousness uh, cognizes. And cognizing something means understanding it. So without consciousness working in cooperation with the eye and the object that you're seeing, the sense object, nothing happens. Contact cannot happen. Okay, so you have, therefore, when you look at Abhidhamma, you always hear this, you know, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and then mind consciousness also. The mind uses mind consciousness. And what's important to remember is that eye consciousness cannot work through the ear. <laughs> and ear consciousness doesn't work through the nose. <laughs> So that's why they're calling this when this particular, um, the particular sense door operates, the consciousness comes into play. So a sense door must have a mental process and a physical process operating in the human body. And the, the uh, we'll get to sense doors in a minute. Let's keep going. So next one we say, um, Nama Rupa. Fourth one is Nama, N A M A, and Rupa, Rupa, R U P A. Nama Rupa, all we want you to remember about this, we call this um, mentality, materiality. So we say mentality and draw a line, mentality. Mentality, draw a line, and then you say materiality. 
materiality, mentality, materiality. And this is mental process of the sense doors, mental, mental process of the sense doors, doors for the nest. During of and in capital letters contact. Okay. So that's the mental part of it is the mental part of your eye operating through the optical system, the mental part of the auditory system operating for contact with the sound. Okay, the mental part of the uh, olfactory system, uh, smelling an odor and having it operate. The mental contact, the mental part of the operation for the oral system when it's operating, the same thing. And the body, um, the mental process of body contact occurring. And then the mental process of the mind making contact, there is still a mental process for the brain to operate to do that part for the mental contact, okay? Um, so that was the contact. And then I put an and sign then in this sort of an ampersand, um, sign and then I um, underneath that the you say the material material and we really reduce this down the material physical body part of four or of, of, of each of the six sense doors, the six sense doors, okay? And below that, if you wanna say earth element, earth, you can throw in earth element. I don't, you know, that's fine, earth element. And, you're, you're talking about the material physical body part, meaning this ear, this nose right here, the, whirp, 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 the lips, okay, and the, um, the body, the, and the, the body, and the tongue, you know, the tongue is the part of the oral system for taste, for flavors, and the physical body, the physical body. This was the simplest, most compact, reduced out point that we could describe this. So the mental process of the sense door is the mentality and the material uh, mentality, materiality. Materiality is the material's physical body part of each one of the sense doors as they operate. And that's that one. Number five, number five. Okay, now number five um, is actually the sixth sense basis. So you're gonna say salyatana, salyatana, all right, all right. S um, A L. Um, I don't think there's an A. I think it's just S A L Y A T A N A. I think that's right. Major, is that right? Can you tell me? S A L Y A T A N A, right? Okay. So that's your Salyatana. And then below it in the square, you say your six cents doors six sense doors or you can say six sense bases i think the sutta says bases a lot you know doors or you can say bases if you want okay and these are really simple because you all know these and basically the um example is you have you just need to remember in the experience of this in um sensing 
the external and there's an internal experience. So the five, um, the five external, external sense doors. Right? And then underneath that, you say it's eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and um, body. And this is the sum total of the way that you experience the external experience in this existence through these five sense doors. And and then one, there's one internal sense door, and that is mind. Okay, so that puts that one there. Okay, the next one we do is feeling. We are up to weight in it. Now six, I'm sorry, what happened here? Wait a minute, contact, we forgot contact. Okay, contact, basa, basa, six, basa, P-H-A-S-S-A, -S -S -A. basa. Okay, and in basa, example, um, uh, underneath FASA, you just put in capital letters CONTACT. That's CONTACT. And then below that, in your column, you will put EXAMPLE. EXAMPLE. With the colon, right? And what we did was say THE I on one, THE I plus sign. Next line, color and form, color plus color and form. Plus sign. Then below that, I consciousness, consciousness. Plus sign. And then below the I consciousness, you put an equal sign, equals, and, and we say, we put the line in from the text because we like you to really remember this. Um, meeting of the three, meeting of these three is I, dash contact, eye contact, period. Then below that we say this works, this works. The same way, the same for all six. Send stores. Okay, that's that column. Now the next column is the Wedana. Seven is Wedana. Um, v E D A N A is your poly word, okay? Then you have in bigger letters, feeling, capital letters, feeling. Okay, and feeling what we want you to remember, um, three kinds, you say in the column, three kinds with a, the colon, okay. One is a pleasant feeling. Two, painful feeling. And three, we write it out, <laughs> neither 
pleasant nor painful, pleasant nor painful. That's really all we put there. I'm just gonna comment one thing. Someday, I, I really don't know how to teach this to you. Uh, we used to get, have painful meetings about this. <laughs> Do not say pleasant, painful, and neutral because it isn't the same as a neutral feeling. And it's a fascinating thing, but it's really, you're kind of at a loss how to explain this, uh, but they're pleasant feeling. There's a painful feeling, and then there's a feeling that is neither painful nor pleasant, but it's not the same as a neutral. Uh, so I, I, and then you can go all over the place with that. So we just say, we just put it down this way. And the reason we put it this way is because this is the way you're going to hear it in the sutta. And it's real. That's all I'm gonna say right now. Okay. Then you turn your page over now, you can turn it over so that you have um, just the uh, five more columns that you're gonna do here, okay? And um, number eight, Number eight is going to be tanha. Now we come to the good stuff, huh? <laughs> okay, tanha. Okay, and tanha is craving. Big How do you letters, spell it? capital How do you letters, spell it? craving in the square. And then what we, we desperately want everybody to memorize and say by heart, Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness. In the mind, in the, in the, right? Is that right? Yeah, in the mind, and in the body. Okay, don't turn it around and and say. Um, I mean, what I'm trying to teach you is how to stay perfectly in line with what you're going to hear in the suttas. So you're always going to hear. Um, in, in the mind and in the body. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind always appears first in the suttas. You never hear the sutta saying body and mind. You hear the sutta saying mind and body. Um, the next one we go, oh, okay, there's another piece to this. And then you, you leave a space and then you say, it is revealed. as the I, in, in uh, quotes, I like it, or the I, again, in quotes, don't like it. Mind at the bottom mind it's the i like it or the i don't like it mind and it's a real interesting spot because it's the very first personal opinion in the entire process that's popping up we'll get to that in a minute we'll talk about that okay now the next piece is number nine number nine is um Upadana, U-P-A-D-A-N-A, -A -A. Upadana, Upadana, okay, and this one is clinging. Now make no mistake about this, these are two separate links, they are not one link. They both have a tendency or a, um, kind of a symptom that we could say is grasping. 
but the real one that holds on suddenly tightly is the craving and the clinging when you listen to the definition for the clinging you'll see it's a it's it's a bit different because crave a clinging um you start at the top of your column you say this is the story is the and then story that runs in our mind about and capital letters why why and then i like it why i like it or i don't like it we wanted to give you a very clear picture of what happens when um well i don't like whatever arises what well i just said like it i don't like it uh whatever arises arises okay mm -hmm. all right then a space and then you say this includes all of the thoughts comma concepts you want to underline concepts opinions comma ideas comma and imagination that pops up now technically really technically when you if you were talking about it in a little smaller version or in the brain what's happening is you're you're describing one of these one of these circles cycles one of the complete circles but when you get into clinging you're actually spinning them off really faster than you can count them but we're going to stay with this one circle here and when these start spinning off, they're making more and more and more circles and they're begging for you to eat it up. <laughs> Pay attention to it, make it into hindrances, stop meditating. That's what's happening with clinging. When you, when you get into that explosion of the thoughts uh, that include all of the thoughts and concepts. Now, the reason I said underlying concept is what is a concept? A concept, we're going to use the simple one. A concept is a concept of an automobile. When I ask you, we stand in front of an automobile and I ask you, where is the automobile? Okay. Is it the windshield? Is it the tires? Is it the roof? Is it the engine? <laughs> we can go through all the parts of an automobile. You can do this with your shoe. A shoe is a concept, but where is the shoe? Is it the sole, the sides, the ties, the tongue, the inner part, the padding? What is the shoe? You see? So all of our language, which is freaky, all of our entire language in all of the languages is constructed of concepts. So it's really hard to get clear about some of the things you talk about in Buddhism because we're, we're looking at moving towards something, the awakening and the, the experience of Nibbana, which is a place of no concept. And so we cannot, we're not supposed to be able to possible not possible to write a book about Nibbana. 
We can only write about what Nibbana is not to help you understand what to let go of to get near it, but we can't talk to you about what it is because we have no language that is not a concept. It's a fascinating thing to think about sometimes. Okay, the next one is number 10. Now, number 10 is the bhava. It's called bhava, B-H-A-V-A, -A, but we say wa, bhava, bhava. And we call this habitual um, tendencies. That was the original way we looked at this. In parentheses, you can put, just in parentheses, in that same little square, emotional, emotional reactions, emotional reaction library. That's what that is. It's the emotional reactions library. And they're reactions. These are not actions. This is not something you cognize and act, have an action that happens afterwards. This is a recognizing something, recognizing something, and you react with a reaction. These words are fun. Okay, so habitual tendencies in the column, we say a personal library of re capital letters actions actions which you repeat in life um life's i'm sorry life and then situations, life situations, following the clinging link, a big space, and then you put a space in there, and then you say each person, each person has a personal library of their reactions, which they developed growing up as they grew up, as they grew up. This is how it happens. We see people as a child, we see things, we copy, we copy, we copy. Gradually, we think we develop a lot of our own um, responses, but a lot of times when a person stops as an older person and they look at keep track in a little notebook what they do repeatedly in a relationship or in a situation at work they're faced with or some threat the way they respond every time the same way they begin to realize uh, they're they're looping they uh have a tendency to loop like on a piece of uh, short film on a website that key is keep replaying. It's a recording that goes over and over and over and over again without justification, based totally on assumption, without information. You don't really know what's happening. You immediately react. That's what these are. Okay, number 11. I have a question, I have a question about the word that you put after. Yeah, about the word, what? There was a word that I missed. This, Which uh, one? After clinging. Ulysses? Before, yes, after clinging. Before each person, you said you use a word. After, after clinging, clinging comes habitual tendencies. 
No, no, no. I'm talking about in the column, in this column of Bawa. In the column, a personal oh. library of reactions which you repeat in life situations following the clinging link. Happens Thank very you. Fast. Yeah? Question? I got it. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Now uh, we go to 11. And now we call this um, Jati. Hmm. And um, my question was with Jati. Um, You can have Kanika Jati and Kanika Marana. <laughs> Kanika means um, uh, um, lit happening little, little ones, little over and over and over, little, 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 little tiny ones. <laughs> this is really fun. Okay. Kanika Marana is um, a rising, passing away, a rising, passing away, a rising, passing away. But okay, here, Jati is. And then we call it birth of reaction. Now, the way I want you to write this is birth and then of in the middle. And you say react, re-dash action. And right, you draw a line. And then you can say action under that. OK? And the reason is because you use this chart, and in the beginning, you're just living off reactions. But eventually, you're going to choose an action and follow through. So I put it on there both ways. And in the column, this says, this is the birth of a or of a reaction or an action. And there are three kinds of actions. You space and then you say three kinds of actions. And you just put one, two, three, and you repeat what you put in the other column. The one first kind is mental reaction, a verbal reaction, or a bodily. Or, or you can say physical. Physical action. Those are the kinds of actions we deal with. And number 12. Okay, number 12, at the top, we say Jaramarana, J-A-R-A, and then the second word is M-A-R-A-N-A. -A -A. Now, I know there's a longer one, uh, but I don't have space to put it in there. There's another way of saying this poly word for each piece of this, but when we look at this, um, it's very interesting. They say, um, usually you hear this as aging and death, okay? And then one day I figured out that aging and death is a nickname for this link. <laughs> and that actually, actually what this is, is aging. So in the little square, do it small because you say it's aging and then uh, comma, sorrow, comma, lamentation, comma, pain, comma, grief, I-E-F, right, comma, and despair, D-E-S, P-A-I-R, and then at the bottom, in big letters, you put death again. Aging and death should be in capitals. Aging at the top should be in um, the capitals. 
and then death at the bottom. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. We have a real interesting thing for this because somebody said to me, well, did he actually explain what these are? Or is he just using these words or what, what's happening here? And then Bonte said, well, why don't you go to 140? And if you go in Yemajima Nikaya to 140, it's 141, sorry, 141, you're gonna find the uh, exposition of the truths and then when it starts to explain, uh, defines, define everything, it starts with one paragraph for each one of these. So it says first, it says the noble truth of uh, suffering, uh, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, the noble truth of the way, leading to the cessation of suffering. But the interesting part is when you go down here, you see birth and aging and death. And then, then you say, what is this part that is in the end? Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair. And the Buddha was really meticulous with this. So he says sorrow, the sorrow, sorrowing, sorrowfulness, inner sorrow, inner sorriness of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state, and this is called sorrow. Then he says, and what friends is lamentation? It is the wail and lament, the wailing and lamenting, the wailing and lamentation of one who has encountered a misfortune affected by some painful state, that's called the lamentation. And what, friends, is pain? Now watch this, he's very meticulous. Bodily pain, bodily discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling born of bodily contact, that's called pain. But, and what, friends, is grief? Now he comes mental pain, mental discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling born of mental contact, this is called grief. Do thoughts and laboring on your thoughts and building more thoughts and getting depressed and all that is, this is the despair. And then what friends is not to obtain what one wants is suffering that we were not subject, I'm sorry, is suffering to, be, to being subject to birth, there comes the wish Sometimes, oh, that we were not subject to birth, that birth would not come to us, but this is not to be obtained by wishing and not to obtain what one wants is suffering. So they take it out to the extent of the three lifetime thing and they, they're using from that angle, they're giving you that definition right there. But in the chart, what we put for this column, we say in the column, this link, this link indicates, indicates the, the aging of this event, this one event, this one event. And then the suffering in the form of, and then space, the aging of the event, comma, the sorrow, lamentation, comma, pain, grief, and despair, as a result of the event 
And then the final death of this event. Okay. Okay. So now you have, if you got that and everybody kind of have it, now what you have is a big chart. <laughs> okay. And now you need to label certain things on this chart that you have to understand. First of all, we said ignorance is the lack of knowledge and not understanding the dependent origination, the Four Noble Truths, and the three characteristics. So we folded that over because we're working on that. And we say that one's gray. Now, technically, what we did with this was we made the, um, we took a yellow highlighter and we made the second and third formations and consciousness we make those yellow, okay? And we say that these yellow ones underneath, underneath where we wrote Sankara and Vinaya, you put in parentheses a, that go across that whole two columns and you call that potential, potential. And there's a couple of reasons why we're doing this uh, is because these formations kicks the whole thing off and makes it start moving. Okay. Uh, the consciousness is not active until you um, are actually going to use the six sense stores and it becomes active. It's both of these links formations and consciousness are not links. You can watch until you're very, very advanced meditators. You don't, and you're not encouraged to sit there and think you're going to get enlightened either, like one person did one time in uh, far away. <laughs> and they basically said, if I could only see the 12, I would be enlightened. <laughs> and I'm there, what, what are you doing? I'm attempting to see the 12. Well, you can't do it that way. It doesn't work that way as far as watching them in your meditation. So the next ones you need to label are the green ones. I don't have a, a green marker, but what would be the green ones would be mentality, materiality, the six sense doors, contact, and feeling. That is, they are impersonal. Now, actually, truth be known, one thing I noticed about this was the potentials are also impersonal. Of course they are, but they're not material, really. They're immaterial. So I'm still not angry at myself for making the green ones uh, are the mentality, materiality, six sense doors, contact, and feeling. So you put one side of your parentheses under where it says Nama Rupa, one set uh, of the left side of your parentheses, and the right side is on the right side of the feeling column, underneath where Vedana is. And then you stretch across there. This is the impersonal, personal, um links impersonal links now what do we really mean by impersonal links it's easy to explain you have nothing to do with these this is something uh, doctors usually understand immediately because this is your impersonal part of your body operations impersonal operation mentality materiality the structure of the body the six sense doors and how they operate, you have no control over them. You do not tell your eye what to see. You do not tell your ear what to hear, your nose what to smell, or your mouth what to taste. You don't do that, okay? Okay, so those are the impersonal links. And contact happens naturally from the operation of the six sense doors and feeling arises. You don't have any way of controlling the feeling that arises, we have nothing to do with that. The important one to really understand is the red zone. 
The red zone is a big parenthesis underneath Tanha on the left side and actually runs all the way to Jati, the right side of Jati. We don't include the last part, the last link. We just go eight, nine, 10, and 11. So this is craving, clinging, habitual tendencies and birth of reaction. This is what we call the red zone. And we say these are personal. These are definitely personal, personal links. And we do have something to do with them, okay? We can learn how to dial them down and slow them down. And we can learn by understanding how they work, exactly how um, this whole thing operates. This is what this is about, okay? Um, now, what I usually do now, everybody has their charts and they color them in, and then we go on to the next page of the, um, the retreat. The, the end one, the end one again is gray. If you're looking to color them, we, we do it like a silver color, the Jaramarana, uh, Jaramarana, right? The aging, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and death, that part, okay. And um, you can stretch your um, parentheses out to the end of 12, or you can leave it at 11. It's sort of a, your own opinion what you want to do with that, okay. So this shows you how your chart works, and the next part of this is to go to I have to go get it for you, I think. I don't think I put it up there, let me see. No, I didn't put it up there. Okay, I have to go get it. Um, I have a quick question. Real quick, go get it. Okay. Okay, so now, I'm going to go back to you guys and I'm going to share one more time now. We're going to go into the new one. Um, we can let this one go. Oh, okay, this is I have the a quick one. question. Whoops, I went too far. Whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> Screen sharing. How did I lose it? Oh dear, let's see. Hmm. Okay, there. Oh, I did get it again. I don't know why I keep going out of that. Just share. Hmm. Let me see. Hmm. Monty, are you there? Yes, uh, yes I'm Monty? here. Monty? Yes. Can you, uh, you see this one? Can you open this one up for me? This one that I'm moving on, can you do that? I am unable to see. What do you want to see at the screen? Um, I'm, I'm it, sharing. Yeah, it is already open. The sharing is I'm, I'm. I want to share this one, but it won't open. Um, no, it should be uh, not from my end. Uh, it is already, uh, from my end, it is all, all, uh, every time is I do it, I go back to the people. I can't, I have to stop the sharing. Wait a minute, share. Yeah, see, no, oh, oh boy. Um, share. Um, uh, let's see, share. Well, stop share. 
There you all are. Now I go to share screen and here's my document, but I can't seem to get it open. No, but we just saw the document. Open. How do I get it open? Ah. <clears throat> which document is the, uh, the question? Which document do you want to open? The one that has the red on it. See it? This one. I'm, can you see where I'm pointing no, no, to it? I cannot see yes. what, what you can this see. This one. Yeah. So you have to just go tab by tab and just select that. I'm sorry, say again? You, there will be uh, different tabs. I usually, just, you have to I usually just, every time I tap twice, I tap once, it won't open. I tap twice and it goes back to you guys. And I don't want you guys right now. I want to go to the share. <laughs> Where? See, I guess you all, really. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Just can't get back to the share. I can't. How, how do I get to it? Well, I need so here, yeah, I can see the document. Which are what document are you talking I about? Can't. I can't. How? What do I do to get you guys to get smaller? I got it. Here we go. <laughs> I on. I'm going to shrink you. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I shrank you. All right. So. This, this is the, we went through this one, okay, and we went through the, now we have, this is the chart that is finished, and now what we have to look at is how is this working with us when we have things happening in our life, okay? Oh, that's the bottom part of your chart. Do you see where the line is for emotions? Do you see, you all see that? What you need to do is if you start in the kind of one quarter of the way into craving and you draw a square that will show where the emotions are happening from the craving uh, to the birth of reaction, like this on the bottom of the chart. You see that? The most important part of learning about this is that your feelings are not your emotions. You're feeling when you, a contact occurs, there is a pleasant feeling that is an uncontrolled pleasant feeling. And then once you go into craving, emotions develop. And the way that you can tell the difference between a feeling and an emotion is emotions have names. We have named all of them. Happiness, sadness, anger, uh, jealousy, um, you know, fear, um, uh, hatred, all these things, uh, these are emotional names, emotion names. So the emotions are happening down here and they have to formulate and these emotions have to formulate, um, boy, you're going away now, I don't know how that works. The, the, uh, the, the emotions have to formulate from the eye. We make the emotion. But when feeling is happening, it's happening before as part of the body. And how do we know this is different? Because when you wire somebody up, you can see where a feeling occurs before an emotion is present. And they've done research with that. So they know it's, it's real. And yet still in the books in psychology, sometimes they come out of school believing that feeling is emotion. It's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. And you can watch how the, 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 what you do with these charts now, this was your 12 link chart. So let's go over it one time. And you, we say, everybody says together, I don't know how we're gonna do that, but we say ignorance, formations, consciousness, and then it, the, it starts operating, but their impersonal operation of mentality, materiality, the sixth sense base, the contact, and the feeling. When this jumps into craving, it's the first, you know you're there. The moment you like it or you don't like it, that's, you know that you have gone into craving. That's your personal opinion base. And from the I like it or I don't like it, with the help of clinging, which is all of the story, why I like it or I dislike it, 
that's how the emotion forms and solidifies. But then what happens is sad because we have this library of habitual tendencies library. And we, with, we don't know it's there. We just keep living like this. And we just have habitual ways of doing things and just never stop. But if we figure out that library exists, we can try and close the door on it. And we can actually have a pause to decide how we're going to have an action that takes place instead of a personal reaction. So this is how the chart helps you. And now when you go to the seven link chart, what we did for you in the seven link chart, we give you a, we're going to give you a six, uh, this chart, the other part of this, we're gonna send you the whole file but we wanted you to make this chart first. Using a seven link training chart, you're only seeing contact and feeling here. And then when it happens, craving, clinging, habitual emotional tendencies and the birth of reaction, these are the red zone. And how do you solve the red zone? Let's look at how the red zone works first real quick. See here, as we show you the emotions at the bottom of this one, the seven link chart. And this one, the emotion shows up in craving and runs all the way over here into aging and death, all the way in there. If there's sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair, there's emotional stuff that's happening, okay? So over here in the left side, you see feeling is not emotion. They, have, they start to happen here. And I'm showing you where they happen. Internal um, sense base meets the external sense base and then, that leads to contact. We cannot hear you, sister. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Share screen. Um, back to this one. Right. Okay. So we're showing you the contact occurs, the feel, painful feeling arises, then I don't like it mind, then anger kicks in. Anger kicks in, carries over. Okay. Uh, come back. What's happened now? Hello, what happened now? I don't know. What happened? I can't. I got lost. What's happened? <laughs> we can see the chart. Are we still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, it is there. It is there. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, let me try to come back in. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I we are hearing here? also and seeing the chart also. Um, no, I don't know how to share. Um, share screen. You are screen sharing. Where is the screen sharing? You are screen sharing already. I can't. I can't seem to get back to you. New share. Okay. Yeah, but we can hear you. You can hear me, but I can't get back to the screen. Okay. What happens is that you practice by, um, if I, I, need the, I need the document to show you the next page. Um, you have another page that I gave you that should look like, can you see me or just hear me? Yeah, yeah we can see you. You see this page that I'm holding up, this one? You should have this one. Do you see this one? Did you get this one? Yes. When I sent you the pages, you should have one like this. This is a special page because this one uh, gives you, it's a blank page that shows you the names of the columns and shows you which ones are personal and which ones um, are impersonal of the links. It's like contact is impersonal and feeling is impersonal, but then Tanha, Upadana, Bawa, and Jati, those are personal. 
on the left side of that page, it tells you, I want you to figure out what happens when anger occurs. And the way this is set up, it was a worksheet for you to look at anger, look at fear, look at panic attack, look at depression, um, use a different kind of panic attack, again, look at anxiety, look at grief, look at depression, and then attachment or aversion, choose one, and look at how it works. So you start by saying, okay, I'm gonna look at anger, so I'm gonna say in the contact column, my ear heard something said at, at me, said to me, and, um, and you said it at me, I took it personally. And so I had a painful feeling come up in my heart and mind. And then under Tanha, you would say, I don't like it. So all of a sudden, I is there, and then clinging, why? Because I remember a similar past event time like this, and I'm repeating this again. I don't like this, and it, I can tell my, I'm repeating it again. Um, and then habitual emotional reaction, whenever something like this, my reaction is my habit is to yell back. If somebody yelled at me and I heard them yell at me, my habit is to yell back. So you see how quickly this happens. If you yell at me, what's happening is a movie and it's called My Life. It's a movie, but you are helpless in this movie unless you understand how a movie is made. A movie is made of a set of frames and in every event in your life, there was a set of frames, but you didn't know they were there. So you are helpless to respond instead of react because you don't understand how you get to this reaction. So once I, my, I choose my reaction and immediately I, this is the birth of my reaction, I yell back. And then the last part is, this is a war. A war is now happening between the other person and me and restlessness, guilt and remorse and sleeplessness, etc., and so forth. And then we just keep doing that with each other. And each time the reaction from the other person is the same, you see? And we're caught in a movie that we could change if we only knew that it was made of frames. This is real. Once you know it's made of frames, then you have to figure out which ones of these frames can I change and help myself? You know, it took me about, I'm sure Bhante could have told me at the time, but he wanted to force me to figure it out. Um, it took a long time for me to figure out how a person heals from this problem of the movie that is happening. And I know the frames are there. I know all these pieces. What do I do? How do I heal? Was my question. How does the person change? And I always got confused because when you read in the text, you have the forward and reverse version of listening to these links, the way that you hear them in Majima Nikaya number 38, forward and then backward. You hear about with ignorance as condition, formations arise, with formations as condition, consciousness arises, you hear them that way. That's the happening of the suffering. Then when you hear the reverse order, you say, but if, Ignorance does not become a condition. If there is no condition, then the formations do not arise. That's how you hear what it's like without, totally without. In other words, the person with the super mundane Nibbana forever, <laughs> he's in that position where nothing is happening, okay? But my question was a problem here because still I was not answered because I could find in um, 107, Majima Nikai number 107, a, an interesting statement, and the statement was the teaching itself was a gradual teaching, 
a gradual practice and a gradual progress. And this translates as a gradual teaching, a gradual practice with gradual, gradual less suffering, gradual release of suffering, gradual improvement. You see? So I'm trying to figure out, well, how is this happening if we're only going to talk about this in the forward and reverse order in the text, how is it going to happen that a person heals? It wasn't for about two years that I, until I had a, a student that was very seriously an anger management student, all right. And when he healed himself, he told me how he healed himself, which woke me up regardless of what you want to say about everything was in the text. It could be in there somewhere. I haven't gotten to it yet. But the truth is, how did he heal? And here's what happened. He heard somebody yell at him, and then contact happened. With contact as condition, a painful feeling arose. But this time, he knew he had watched for a long time how this works, and he was familiar with the painful feeling becoming, I don't like it, and I don't like it because every time this person says this, I get angry and I get upset. And then he also knew that he would then fall into his library and grab the same reaction and give birth to the same reaction and yell back to the other person and was causing a problem at home, across the board, at work, at school, everywhere, all through his life. But as he was looking at it, he told me, I decided to keep a journal. And this is why I try to push a notebook on you guys and start writing down what it is the problem is where it's happening in your life with a relationship or a family member or work or the world or the government or whatever you want to talk about you write it down all right and look at it closely and see when you go through your anger about this whatever it is okay how can you let go of it gradually and heal without becoming an arrow hot, how can you do that? All right, so it's really, it, it, here's what he did. He said, first, I decided from now on, I am not going to yell back. Boom, that's the end of the birth of the yelling back. Over, we're not doing this anymore. I might have a painful feeling and I might not like it and I might be running it through my mind like crazy and grabbing that and I'm just about ready to go but all of a sudden, I am not going to yell back. This is what he told me. The next thing he did, he said, was I realized that every time when I look in my notebook, I am reacting in the identical way, with identical phrases, with identical loudness, everything the same way. I pulled it out of a library. It's a library card catalog, and that's the same card. I pull it out every time for whatever this is, and I react from that, and I give birth to the react. I am closing my library. He said, what kind of a dimwit is going to live their whole life reacting the same way to the stimulus that comes at them, and they take it personally, and then they react the same way again. And he confessed that he was doing this. And he said, I'm not going to use that library. He put a lock on it just like that with a big lock underneath it and locked the doors. He said, when next this happens, I then had it happen. And when it occurred, I just got there and I smiled. I laughed and I stopped my anger. That was the first time he really just left. The other times he shut it down and walked away. This time he laughed and the anger was gone. Then he looked at it, he wrote that one down. And when he looked real closely at it, he said, boy, I did have a painful feeling and I didn't like it. And I could see that my mind was running around like crazy with the same old stories again and again about why. And I don't like this person and they do this and I'm going to yell back. And then he did, and in spite of the, the library being closed, that still was bothering him to have this running through his mind all day. This is papancha, crazy, mental proliferation, won't stop 
run, 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 run and stick with you. And he said, I'm not going to do that tomorrow. So he's left with craving. But he says, but I know what craving is. And I'm not any arahat. And I'm not probably going to do a lot of attainments in this life. But I am going to understand one thing. And that is how this works. And when that person yells at me, I am going to force myself to smile and internally start forgiving. And that's when he started to use his parts of it. No matter what they said to him, he took it as, I'm going to give them the space they need to vent. Everybody is pent up and that's what I'm going to do. And he did. Everybody was angry at this guy, but nobody would stop fighting with him. And he just stopped. And then he said, we need to get a cup of coffee. Let's go get a cup of coffee. And he sat down with this guy and they worked some things out. And he heard the heartache and the sorrow and the problems this man had. And where was this anger coming from? And you know, we just don't know each other at all. And because we don't listen, we never find out. And because as we react, we don't ever get to the place they call peace. So constantly we're being sucked in to this war of running all these links. And we don't need to. Because we universally have a huge problem right now in the world, don't we? And why anybody is taking advantage of it or or using it at all for anything is insane because it had happened this time, it can happen again. And we need to learn to work together to find the answer to all this. But this is how he stopped his anger and his anger had gotten violent. His anger had gotten him in jail when he was younger and his anger was still there. And finally, he saw that he was on this piece of paper. He saw his life on this chart. And once you see yourself on that chart, you start playing with the extra page we gave you, the empty page, and then out we'll send you the whole file. I don't know, um, Major, can we send them the file for them to get the file or something, everybody? Because we don't, I don't know if we have everybody's emails, but they all need the whole file. And they'll have both of the charts but now that you built this chart, you begin to understand. These, these links, look one more time, look one more time before we quit. <laughs> look one more time at your chart. When you look at this whole chart, these links, they are dependent. They are dependent on each other. You see, this one is folding. It's dependent on that one. Once it is ready for the next one to come up, those are done. The link that is up, it has no part of the previous links. This is a fascinating thing. You think that you're compounding these links when you first look at it, but they're co-dependent or co-arising, meaning one of them must be there one of them must be there in order for the next one to arise. But when the next one arises, the first one isn't there anymore. No part of it is. And when the formations, uh, when conscious are the foundation, the condition for consciousness to arise, when the consciousness arises and sets itself up, there's nothing there but consciousness. When that happens, then the mentality materiality, it's, that's all that's there then when the mentality materiality is in place properly as a condition, six sense bases arise. When the six sense bases are operational, then contact can happen. But when contact happens, the six sense bases have nothing to do with contact. Now you're at contact. And so everything is changing, 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 moving Anicca all the time, even in this in this folder, even in this process, okay? So I was gonna read you the thing at the end, but I'm not sure I can find it again <laughs> to read it to you. And then that is the end. And anybody has any questions, 
they should write me with questions or you can um, you can ask some questions now if you're you're still hanging in here. Let me see if I can get back. Oh, I see what happened. Hmm. No. Okay. Hmm. Return to the meeting. There. I have an option to return to the meeting. I can't come back to you guys. I can't find you. Let's see. Okay. You're all here. Okay. Now, does anybody have any questions now that your mind has been totally blown by this thing? <laughs> When we, when we have 12 people and we do this with 12 people, usually, usually about 12 around one big table, they're constantly throwing questions as we're doing it. <laughs> so we usually get through in an hour and a half. So does anybody have any questions about this, the links or anything that I can answer for you right now? Sister, um, I have a question Yep. Um, that about feeling. So feeling when it comes up pleasant or uh, painful, uh, we are able to pick it up. So why is it an impersonal link? We are able to what? I mean, we, we realize that we are feeling something pleasant or painful. Whoops, so it is- Your connection's it, not good. Um, oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I think I was losing words. Try okay. again. So uh, since uh, with the feeling, uh, the pleasant and the painful, we realize when it's happening to us. So it, it feels it's personal. It's very, very quick. This is very, very fast, this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're, instead of it being a movie, like if you go to the movie and you sit down in the movie, you watch the movie, you don't have any idea when you see an IMAX. Each one of the each one of the um, each one of the frames in an IMAX movie is uh, this big, the same size as my cell phone, and there's three and a half miles to one movie, three and a half miles of these, and that's what you're watching, and this is how this is working in your brain. It's working very, 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 very fast. But what we're trying to show you is how you can watch one event. Okay, so the question, tell me your question again. Um, why is feeling uh, an impersonal link? It feels feeling personal. Feeling is part of the human anatomy and the neurologist will tell you that the feeling occurs before an emotion happens. Feeling is part of the physical body. It is impersonal, part of the physical of the, the anatomy of the human body. In other words, you do not tell your eye what to see. You do not tell your ear what to hear. It would be crazy for you to tell me, oh no, it's my sight, it's my sound. No, it isn't because the sight or the sound, it arises, it's there, it passes away, but you and I, we are still here after that. You see? So mm -hmm. how can it be mine? It can't be mine. It's separate from me. It's part of my bodily part. So the feeling is included in that group. If they wire you up and you're totally unconscious, mm -hmm. but they wire you up and they touch you a particular way and you start to respond, the feeling, they can tell what the feeling is that's happening if a person is put on a drug or if they're, um, I can't remember, there's something they do in the emergency room. Sometimes the priest says, I can't understand why the person doesn't jump, but you can register, they can see the person is having a painful feeling. When you can tell if the person is in pain or is not in pain without having them to be awake and say it to you now with some of the equipment they use. That being said, that is definitely the feeling is a um, you know impersonal link, it's not personal. It's not you're not there but craving once you say whether the opinion comes in I don't like this and then I don't want it and then you start moving into the reasons why you don't like it and you don't want it 
and it runs through your mind real quick from past events, this feeling. And by the time you, I couldn't say how young, but definitely by the time you're probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 15, maybe earlier than that, you're cycling based on an awful lot of stored up information in your brain of when this happens, this is what I do. When this happens, that's what I do. I see this, I do this. I hear this, I do this. I smell this, I run. I, you see all, all these things. They're established in a storage bin that's called the Habitual Tendency Library. And so we're living our life and when people are really emotionally upset and um, you know, psychologically really upset in relationships, sometimes if they begin to realize that this chart exists and they start to learn this, sometimes they can really get straightened out because they begin to see how everything is working and they see hope of being able to stop reacting and then stop doing the same thing every time. The, the um, what you call it, um, the impact from the sense door occurs. Impingement, the impingement occurs. Stop reacting automatically. Pause a second, decide how to respond. Then do a birth of action instead of the birth of a reaction. You see how it works? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it takes a bit of a bit of uh, testing for yourself and in your practice and watching carefully. And Deepa, you have enough of a practice. You can begin to watch how this is working. And mm -hmm. now that you, you have the chart, you'll be able to watch closely. You can see how feeling happens before the craving, clinging, habitual tendency jumps in. You see? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Who? I heard somebody. I can't hear who it is. I can't hear the person. Can you see the question in the chat? I'll just put it there. Who is it? This is Hindu. Hindu. This is Linda? Hindu, Hindu. Linda, you have to turn I your um, turn your. Talking, uh, I think somebody's talking in the background to somebody else. Oh, Linda. I'm sorry. I thought it was. I thought it was Linda. Maybe her iPhone wasn't. Her her volume wasn't on. Okay. No, she said she will put a question in chat. You read that. I have put it. Oh, she would send it to okay. me. Okay. Yeah. Um, I cannot see that. I don't know what happened then. Okay, can you just hold up your chart? I want to see how you... Who is it? This is Hindu. Hindu, Hindu from Mumbai. I'm not seeing the name on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just... They have written now. Okay. Um, one of the things that I... One of the things that I, I set up about this was trying to explain how a car, when you drive a stick shift, um, how this chart operates like driving a car. It's like an automobile. If you put the key in the ignition and you turn... She just uh, wanted to know how to put the yep. uh, charts uh, wanted to, know what? to uh, create a chart. Santi? She just wanted to know how to put two pages together. Uh, so Do you want me to come in again? Can... Should I come in again? No, I don't think uh, she, uh, what she's asking, Hindu is asking is, please hold up your chart I'm to sorry, see what? how you have put two sheets together. So this <laughs> chart is not uh, something which we have done two sheets. It is for you if you want to do. Hindu, can you... Uh, We've yeah. done something yeah. wrong? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, so it is uh, just uh, you have to keep two pages over here and put a uh, cello tape. And then who this is, is it? For you. And what is we the question? Hindu. Hindu is there from in, uh, Mumbai. Okay, I understood. Mumbai. Now. Okay. 
so we have folded one sheet into six and we put the next one to it. Folded. Yeah, two sheets which you put like this and then put a cello tape to make okay. it a long sheet. Okay, okay. got it. Okay. What is I happening? Yeah, she got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking uh, to the moon. <laughs> Mr. Kema. Yes? I have a few questions. Okay. So with the feeling being three kinds of feeling, um, my understanding is there sh would be three kinds of craving to match each of the feeling, or am I understanding it wrong? I'm so sorry, far? three kinds of craving? No, don't go there. Just understand that craving is when I hits, the I hits. After the feeling happens, I have an opinion about that feeling. You either yeah. like it, you want it, and you move towards attachment, or you don't like it, you don't want it, and you move towards aversion and then attachment to get rid of it. See, that's the only thing that happens. There isn't anything more. Uh, See, this is, a, this is a crazy thing because so many people have made this so difficult to understand with so many pieces. And it took us a long time to make this small enough to make it work for you in your meditation. So only think about is feeling is either pleasant or painful or neither painful, pleasant nor painful. But just use two of them, pleasant or painful. That's enough. Um, okay. Enough is a good thing. <laughs> Too much <laughs> makes everything complicated and you don't need to think about this. It's like this, the big awareness of this chart is what opens the doors and allows you to watch how things are working. You can, what you can get accustomed to is when something happens, you know, uh, people said, yeah, but how do I, how do I experience it? So uh, when I was teaching it in the uh, university, I put up a thing called the, uh, the story of the car. And so, you know, you have a key. And when you get in the car, you put the key in, and that's contact. There's no movement of the car. And then when you start turning the key in the ignition, the engine starts, and that's feeling. The engine is running. You can feel it. Unless you're in an electric car, they're, they're fooling around with my simile. <laughs> but if you're in any other kind of car, when you turn the car on, uh, the engine gives you a little bit of vibration. You can feel this, okay? The contact, and that's the feeling. And then what happens is the craving hits. And when the craving hits, it's first gear. When you're driving a stick shift, the first gear, you don't drive around in it, but the purpose of the first gear in a truck or a car or a piece of equipment is to get it moving get it moving, rolling. So first gear is a jerk to start, and second gear speeds up, that's clinging. It speeds up, the first one was craving, the next one is clinging. And then the, you're going to go down the ramp and get on the highway and start speeding down the ramp, that one is habitual tendency. You saw the highway, now you're gonna drive down on the highway. And then the next one is fourth gear, and that is where you, the action speed, the birth of the action, you got to go as fast as the cars in the highway. And you keep going, yeah? And you start driving 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, or whatever, 90 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, whatever, okay? And now you're going really fast, okay? And then all of a sudden, what happens is you, you run out of gas. <laughs> And you go, have to coast to the side of the road. And the end of this event is very sad because when you get out, you're looking in the back of the car. Nobody put the extra gas in there. And then you look at your phone and there's no power in your phone. And then you have what? Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair until you can find somebody who will let you call somebody to get help and get off the road. That's the end of the event, the end of the story. But what I'm trying to show you is how does it feel? The contact is just the contact. Then a feeling comes, the feeling. 
some kind of feeling, pleasant or painful, that's it. Don't go any more than that. You see, the, you know, the, the one thing about um, 56 says uh, many kinds of feeling, and 56 or 59, and there's another one too about that. Mm -hmm. And um, the one where there's the argument between the two men, I say it's two kinds of feeling you need. And the other one says, no, I've heard about three kinds. And the other, and yeah. the other one, yes, but there's five kinds. And they, okay, let's yeah. go talk to the Buddha. And then the Buddha gives them the talk. Yeah. And he says, though, there's, there's two kinds, you're right. And there's three kinds, you're right. But then, you know, there's, there's uh, 12. And then over here, there's, uh, there's uh, six. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, 12. And then there's 18 kinds. And then there's 36 kinds. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you don't need all those. To understand this whole chart, you need pleasant and painful feeling. And so we tested this and you test it with the person. The problem with the, per the, problem with the Abhidhamma is not the Abhidhamma, it's what people do with the Abhidhamma. And if they put it in their head and start talking about 128 different kinds of feeling, and when I get a feeling, which one is it? Oh my gosh, that's unnecessary in the process of realizing there's a feeling, you need to just let it go, relax, smile, come back. Just that's it. See? Okay. So try um, to keep it as simple as possible in, in, in keeping with the practice, but letting you see I took you today into the editing room of your movie, and your movie's name is My Life. That's the name of your movie. And you never saw the movie taken apart before, and this is the movie taken apart with all the different links. That's what we're trying to show you. Get it? Yes, um, Sister yeah. Kima, I just have a few more other uh, questions. So the okay. clinging. Okay. Um, Which one? The clinging, so to simplify it, is it just a runaway mind? Yeah, but what is the runaway mind about? Is it about something else? Then it's compounding and rolling over on you. But the clinging is actually um, it is all of the, um, it is the story that is in our mind about why I like it or I don't like it. It's I like it and why do you like it is the clinging and you don't need to know why. That's the big one, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. when the hindrance comes up, and you start, something hits you and you say, I don't like it. You should be doing your six R then and letting go and coming back with a smile. But these are, we teach you this so that you know the signs of moving too far into this. And in order to avoid moving into it, what are the signs or the symptoms of each of these uh, links? You see mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the contact, uh, the, the feeling, when that comes, the identify and having that experience and the craving, its attention and tightness is built up from the feeling really fast. And you mm -hmm. feel the change in the tension and sight and tightness. The more that you smile and the more that you six are, the less tension you're letting, uh, more tension you're letting out of the body and mm -hmm. you have less and less tension. The less tension you have, the easier it is to see when the ch changes to more tension. So you let go sooner and sooner and sooner and sooner. Mm -hmm. If you understand that principle, you'll keep letting go until you reach the deeper states. If you get involved in thinking, analyzing, under trying to decide that you need to know, I want something personally to understand, you're getting involved with the Atta is catching you and the curiosity is taking you in the wrong direction. You mm -hmm. need your curiosity in, in your level where you're watching, okay? Okay, okay. Um, then just two more quick questions on the bhava and Another the jati. Question? Yeah, just two more quick questions on the bhava okay. and the jati. So is the, um, can I think of it as the bhava as like What's kind of a, a noun and jati as kind of the verb? Of that I mean, I missed, I'm not hearing you. Wait a second, something's wrong. Can you say it again? Um, okay, so the question is on the connection between bhava and jati. 
So can I think of it as Baba is like the noun version and Jati is like the verb version of Baba the, is like what? Like the like the noun version. So when you say the Baba is um, what? Noun N O U N. It's like when you say it's a personal library of reactions. It's in your head. It's in your head. It's like if I took this, if I took this, see this? If I took this and I said, my storage library is in here. I stuck it in my ear and it went in my head. It's in my head. And you go in and it happens very fast. You choose one and go out, out of habit. You keep doing the same one for whatever the impingement was, what, however, somebody pokes you, if they poke you in the arm, you react one way. If they poke you in the head, they, you react a different way. You see what I mean? And you have all these things saved up from when somebody said something to you, you took it personally and went off and made a story about it and got all involved with it for days and worried about it. Those are habitual tendencies to do that. Instead, you want to dismiss the habitual tendencies and just let go of things. Let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. You have the guidelines to let go. You have the rules about everything changes. You have the hindrances have nothing for you. And those, those personal involvements with thinking about stuff that comes up, that's a hindrance and you're feeding it food. And you're giving it, uh, you know, a lot of nutriment, so it'll keep happening. You see? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thinking um, about stuff is a no-no. If you're going to meditate, you keep watching, and the moment you find yourself thinking while you're meditating, six R, and just come to be doing the the uh, the business of the place where you're working with your object of meditation. You get it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I get that part, sister. I get just it? have one, one. Hello? Can you hear Did me? Did I still? lose you? Hello? Can you still hear me? Um, hello? I think sister came out as uh, a uh, connection is problem. Okay. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah, I just had a final question, Bante. And the question is, with Baba or habitual tendencies, is it possible to carry habitual tendencies from a previous life into the present one? Yeah, uh, that is kind of an understood thing. Uh, it is underlying uh, that habitual tendencies can be uh, current. Uh, that could be uh, very uh, current uh, uh, tendencies which you have taken up. It can be in this lifetime and it can be from the other lifetime. So there, a habitual tendency has implicit uh, uh, in itself that it, it is a learned uh, action. So it can be a current uh, lifetime, uh, is present, it can be in a uh, current lifetime from your childhood or something like that, or it mm -hmm. can be previous life kind of understood. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. If, if, it, if, if it can be then carried forward from a, if the Baba can be carried forward from a previous life. I um, lost it. <laughs> if okay. it can be. Uh, she's back. I get, I, she's <laughs> just asking if Baba is something which. No, uh, I mean, when she was just speaking, I get three words and country. I lose two and I see her mouth moving. I have a bad connection. Okay, it's kind of. Can you hear me? I can hear now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question was. I always is think I can hear, and then when we start speaking, sometimes it doesn't come through. I just some. Can you hear me? I, I can't. Can you, I, I, you said, "Can you hear?" And I heard, "Can you?" <laughs> okay. I don't know. I can hear. <laughs> I only okay. heard, should we end I didn't it? hear here. Uh, should we end it now? It is already 9.30. I know, I know. Just one second. I want to show you guys one thing. Um, okay. 
um, the end of this, I just want you to, um, this is your, some other questions on here. Basically at the end of this, all it was about is so Q, Q was wondering the whole time this thing is built, what, when you have the correct information about mind and body and the correct practice that allows you to see how things actually work, you will come out of the dark into the light. Fear and doubt will fade away now because you understand Anicca and you know how to detect the symptom of a rising craving and how to let it go. Once you have the Buddha's advice and you carry out the harmonious practice of right effort correctly using the six Rs, you'll begin to realize it is possible to purify and retrain the mind to stop runaway thoughts and stop the reactions to the events. Instead, you'll begin to respond and do what needs to be done. And so it is the knowledge and the vision and the practice that sets us free. Applying that knowledge is in practice is what sets you free. You recognize the arising tension in the unwholesome mind state, release the state and relax the tension left in the mind and the body follows also and relaxes. You then bring up a wholesome mind state with a sincere little smile and you return mind's attention to whatever task you are doing to move on. You, and then you continue on sending out loving kindness to the spiritual friend or Karuna to the directions or whatever you are doing for your object at this time. And if needed again, you will repeat this same practice cycle only by releasing and relaxing the tension and tightness that is in the way and always replacing it with a smile will wholesome actions take hold to become your normal response in the future. And why, Q says, because Lord Buddha said, when you th whatever you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. And what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. And whenever a serious emotional state arises, this is a hindrance. We can laugh or six R as we can take, or we can take it seriously. In that instant, a space opens up in our mind to consider what to do logically without assumptions involved. And when you stop taking an event personally, ignoring the content, you next replace the emotional state with a higher state of an open mind. Lightly laughing at being caught off balance in life helps to shift the perspective in life. You take a look at the level of your humor to see how you are doing with your practice. Are you smiling? Are you taking things less personally? You keep up this good humor. This is the chart that you guys are receiving with the file that I'm sending to you. This one here, this is the one I was trying to show you how you, this is an example on the top line with anger and you have a chance to figure it out with the other way and just make a copy of it and use it again and again. And then this is the page that gives you all of the links where you can just memorize them uh, to memorize the Pali and the English for them. And in closing, I just want to thank you for attending one of the dependent origination workshops and your comments are really appreciated for this project. And I'm really interested how you're going to use the information at home. So don't be shy and let me know. Please let me know. Because when people learn and understand this process and begin to use it in life properly, many, many problems become lighter very quickly and many nice things begin to happen. It's suggested that you take an online meditation training retreat after the workshop when you can learn how uh, to continue practicing right effort all the time in life and observe these links in action. And while you're taking an online retreat, 
A guide can help you to identify how you are caught in your meditation. And this is just talking about how it works and the process reveals the secret of why Buddhism was historically considered to be priceless. It, uh, it goes passing through the doorway to peace. And during your training, you become sensitive and able to identify unwholesome mind states earlier as they're arising. And so you let go of them and relax more quickly as you shift into wholesome mind states with a smile. And at that time, you reached the doorway of peace. So now it's time for you to imagine how this teaching can take us through a doorway permanently in the world for peace, because that is what the highest super mundane Nibbana is all about. And you remember what you think and ponder on because the inclination of your mind is the direction of your actions, okay? And that's basically the end of that, the pages that we lost. So you get a copy of that file with, oh, it's about six pages now. It used to be, I think, well, yeah, six pages, I think. So is there anybody else who has any questions or are we okay? <laughs> I'm the only one that's connected anymore. Hello. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, this Okay. Continue. Are we all set? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's say a prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Say sadhu, sadhu, 